This is FinTech Futures at Cybos, and I'm joined by Caroline Haas of NatWest. Caroline, thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with us. Just to get started, would like to give us a quick introduction to yourself and your role at NatWest. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for asking me to come to this afternoon. Um, I head up the Climate and ESG Capital Markets team within NatWest, where we really do cover all ranges of customers from the corporates, the financial institutions, out to private equity and uh, really sort of service them on what they need for their sustainability journeys. Excellent, excellent. And you're here speaking on a panel about building standards into green finance. For those not in attendance, would you be able to give us a quick rundown of, of what was covered there and some of the key takeaways that came out from that? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, for years, we've all wanted standards and we really do need them. And now, ironically, there's this little bit of a pushback saying, are actually now standards too much? Um, we need a combination of them. And this space is so new that actually you need guidance, you need standards, you also need them to be regulatory versus just voluntary. And then you almost need to do a review and a slight reform of what was initially done. We've just seen that actually on the SFR, uh, SFDR um, regarding Article 8 and 9. Um, so I think I really welcomed in COP26 when the ISSB was initially announced and it was fantastic to see even after 18 months them to release the uh, standards or the suggested metrics, KPIs around S1 and S2, one being more sustainability and the other one much more focused on climate. Now. Obviously, we need to bear in mind that there are going to have to be differences um, if that is between large corporates and uh, small and medium sized enterprises. Similarly, that there's going to have to be adjustment between the developed world versus the developing world and the respective metrics that are going to be required, um, accepting that there are different materiality or maturities along those. Excellent, excellent. And NatWest has just recently published its Global Fixed Income Investor Survey. Um, can you tell us some of the top level findings from that? So I think, you know, it's always funny. People, well, maybe I'll take a step back. Um, the survey went out to 225 asset managers. It was actually very equally split between um, a third, a third, a third being Europe, APAC, and North America. And what was very welcoming to see is that 71% of the respondents actually said that they had made net zero commitments. What was also interesting was to hear that 39% of them felt that they were ahead of budget. Um, I would say there is definitely a tendency that one will point to Europe being further ahead, followed by the US and then a slight lag coming through APAC. Um, I, I think that was definitely reconfirmed at the same time, it was interesting to see how quickly the U.S. asset managers actually have come on stream over the last 18 months. Um, the other key takeaway, I would say, is how much they're using the raw data. Um, often it is assumed that the ESG ratings are feeding into those investment decisions, when actually it's ESG scorecards that each asset manager creates for themselves, and they use the data that it flows in through the um, data providers. So I think uh, it was a lot of reaffirmation for us. Um, what again was slightly called out is that although regulation is helpful, it is also at this point slightly confusing. Excellent, excellent. So what would you say uh, would be the most important thing then to fix income ESG investors? So staying on the decarbonization and climate theme, I think what's interesting is how often we now hear what are the transition plans of the entity that they would like to invest in. Now, obviously, a green narrative is lovely, but actually we really need to transition the real economy. And that is not just one number. People like to focus on a scope one, two, or now in the future, three, but it's actually how are they going to do that and how is that going to affect their supply chains? How are they going to actually communicate that and hold their management accountable to that actually happening? Um, the other piece is, I think, how that now relates into the products. And the products, obviously, it's transparency that is the key point that they call out. Um, SLBs are obviously a newer product versus the use of proceeds bonds. And how do you make those robust material and really sort of something that people feel are credible? Um, and the final thing I would call out is clear disclosure and reporting. And obviously the standards that I talked about on ISSB will help because it will get guides. Right now, it is very qualitative and obviously very verbal in a way versus it being actually distinct numbers. And once that happens, you can benchmark more easily and decide who are the outperformers or the underperformers. 
So when you take all of that together, I think the asset managers, um, some of the sort of institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies, what they're really trying to use engagement is to find out those pieces of information that will help them for their investment decision. Excellent. So, so what are some of the impacts of decarbonisation frameworks on, on fund managers and how is this aligned to reporting standards used by corporates globally? Uh, so, you know, as much as regulation is going to drive this, it is going to ultimately be the investing community, um, as well as the lenders, who will, through their support of the corporates on the transition and providing them the financing that they need, that that will very much encourage a accelerated shift around the transition. Now the regulations, when you look at them, a lot of them are actually directed at asset managers. And so it's being forced through the financial ecosystem to actually get the real economy to transition. So there is a distinct link. Um, but at the same time, we are going to see some reiterations of those regulations to ensure that they are actually hitting the note. Because what we don't want is that these regulations become a compliance exercise and that you're just tick boxing it or reporting it versus actually living it and then working with the respective investee companies to dec decarbonize. Excellent. Excellent. And how can you encourage adoption of this, I guess, kind of across the across industry? So, you know, the adoption, it's um, you need to incentivize it now, but the incentives come in multiple um, guises, if you will. There is obviously the financial, but I think especially as you move into the SMEs, what's important is actually helping them understand the issues and giving them the respective tools. These are in the form of digital, digital tools. Uh, for example, at NatWest, we have something called Carbon Planner that we're working with the SMEs where they can upload actually their carbon data, both scope one and two. Um, and enables them to start the journey. There's something else also that is called SPTI, or Science-Based Targets Initiative, and they would like the larger corporates already to set very distinct targets. What they have realized is, and comes back to my earlier point, there are going to be different maturity profiles along this journey, and the SMEs need sort of guidelines, stepping stones to get through that. And so what they've said is if a SME could initially just commit and just sign up as the first step, the second step is then actually monitoring it. And after a three or four year period, you would then actually set a target. So it really gives a clear roadmap that these companies can follow. And that will obviously help with the adoption. Excellent. excellent. I mean, you, you mentioned something there as well, but looking at NatWest, I mean, what kind of initiatives have, have you put in place there to ensure sustainability, not just in the business, but also with, to help customers achieve that as well? So as always, the first place of how do you do that yourself, you have to look internally first. And, uh, you know, when we first started on the climate journey, it was very much get your house in order. And that starts with your own operational footprint and what does that actually equate to. So very much um, NatWest has taken on renewable energy as its primary source of electricity. And that also gives you a, a very good learning position as you start to co communicate with your customers and enable them to transition. So one of the things I talked about was Carbon Planner to really enable the corporates to start monitoring their own data. Um, the second is obviously working with the um, retail customer on their mortgages. We provide a green mortgage product. Um, and similarly in the SME space is looking at the retrofit loans to enable them to actually have financial means to do the retrofits that either their operations require to make them a much more sustainable um, entity. Excellent, excellent. And just to finish off, I mean, net zero has been uh, in the news again quite a lot recently. What would you say financial services in general really needs to do to, to, to achieve that in the maybe, maybe not so much near term, but close to near term? I think it's really important. Financial institutions are actually intermediaries, enablers. Um, it's we help finance the real economy. And so we can only operate in that sort of context. And so the more we do to help our customers transition, the more that we actually enable the real economy to decarbonize. And that obviously will be evidenced in our um, 
on our balance sheet. Um, NatWest made a commitment around the 50% reduction of its emissions by 2030. Similarly, we're looking at our mortgages to have an EPC of C or above um, by uh, 2030 as well. So we have underlined it with specific targets and commitments, but that is also affected by the macro environment that we are in. Um, and so really the, the essence, and this is I think where the asset managers come back to as well, is really having those conversations and really having a, an exchange and almost a compassion for those companies as they go through that journey. Excellent, excellent. Sounds great. Caroline, thank you again so much for taking the time out to speak with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.